the pens off this man. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Hi. Um, thanks for all of you to turn up. This is my talk on exploiting buffer overflows. Um, we're going to be using open source software to um, attack a demonstration application to show what you can do with a buffer overflow. Our victim will be running the software on Windows 7 and our attacking box will be a Kali Linux um, box. So, uh, disclaimers, the views, is it going to work yeah. on that? So the views here are my own, not my employers. Um, the following presentation describes how to conduct a buffer overflow attack, assuming uh, demo gods let me. So, uh, if demo gods are kind, you'll get to see it done in front of you. If demo gods aren't kind, you'll get videos. <laughs> um, these acts, attacks are illegal to perform against systems that you do not have permission to test. You can go to jail. I assume no responsibility for any actions you perform based on the content of this presentation or afterwards, or any subsequent conversations. Caveat, with knowledge comes great power. So, the obligatory who I am I slide, it's just a word cloud. Um, I hold the Offensive Security Certified Professional, the OCP qualification. I'm also a member of the British Computer Society and a Chartered IT Professional. Occasionally sir, I'm occasionally a dad, and I also hold the UK's Tiger Scheme Accreditation for Security Testing, um, accredited by the CESG and GCHQ. And I've been a fan of open source uh, for a long time. My first disk drive I looked up this morning was uh, Fedora Core 2, which came out in something like 2004. So, so anybody tell me who this guy is? No? This guy is John von Neumann. Now he's a little bit special. By the age of eight, he could do calculus, which is pretty impressive. <coughs> he went on to work in the American Nuclear Research Program in the Manhattan Project in Oppen with uh, Oppenheimer. Um, in 1949, he wrote a paper called um, The Replicate Analysis of Self-Replicating Automats. And in it, from that, we get the architecture that modern computers use. He was a really gifted guy. Some of the research this guy did was absolutely amazing. Um, unfortunately, he only lived to 53. But all the computers you've got here are of von Neumann architecture. So we'll just have a bit of a video. This just explains the von Neumann architecture. Essentially, it's a stored program computer. Originally, older computers like ENIAC and Colossus had to be programmed, and they had separate memory for programming data. That's known as a Harvard architecture. This is how our computers work now. They all work this way. So, if you want to see the full uh, excerpt, there's a little bit more, but I just cut it a bit down just to save some time. So, we move on to 1996. This is Frack Magazine. You've never read it. It's a, a journal for hackers. It's been going for a long time. And in 1996, this guy underneath the frat logo, Elias Levy, published the article under the name of Left One, Smashing the Stack for Fun and Profit. It is still today the article to read on how to do a stack based overflow. It describes it in very easy terms. Um, he was quite revolutionary. He founded a company called Security Focus in the late 90s and eventually got taken on. Um, by Symantec. He had a full disclosure mailing list for bugs called Bug Track. But when he went to Symantec, he closed it. And uh, then the full disclosure mailing list that we have today, where bugs are submitted to, uh, came out of it. And it's still there today. So you can sign up to fulldisclosure.org and get all the bugs that people release publicly um, for software. So this is the stack. Um, we have in our computers. It's a program structure. Um, we can store program data variables on the stack. Data is pushed onto the stack and popped off. So if you've got three pushes and you want the bottom one, you've got to do four, three pops to get it off. This is a vulnerable C program. So this is essentially the basis of a buffer flow overflow. We have our main C function here. We define a buffer here. 
and this function copies whatever we give as a command argument into the buffer without any checking. So we've defined it for 20 characters, if we give it more than 20 bytes of characters, we get a buffer overflow. This appears everywhere, string copy is a very well known um, vulnerable C function, there are a lot of other ones, um, just go and Google them on the internet. So if we pass a load of data on that 20 byte, what, what happens? Well, because the data was reserved on the stack, it effectively, the more bytes we go, it goes down the stack and we start overwriting other stuff. If we can overwrite EIP, we can control the execution flow of the program and get it to run our malicious code. That's the ultimate goal. If we can't control EIP, we get a denial of service exploit. So. So within our computers we have certain registers within the CPU and they all have basic functions. So as you can see we have the EAX register which basically does addition the base register which does, oh, I've forgotten, counter register, does counters and loops, data holds data. We put various information into these and we call system functions and it does things in the processor. These pointers point to the areas in our stack and as I said, EIP points to the next address in memory to be executed. If we can overwrite EIP, we can control execution, otherwise we get to another service. Yeah, so let's pause it here. So this is our vulnerable application that we are going to exploit. So if I just get the Windows 7 box. It's composed, it's called Von Server. It was written by a guy to expose for buffer overflows. So it has a number of buffer overflows built into it in various commands, some more complex than others, and it consists of a library here, essfunction.dll, which is part of it. If we start it up, it communicates over port TCP over port 999. So let's just see if we've got a connection here. So this is connecting to it, and if we do help, we can see the list of the commands. It's very similar to sort of an FTP server that you might see. So we can do the trun command, and we can send it a load of legs. And nothing happens, and our server is still quite happily running on Windows 8. So you can write a Python program that can just take all the commands and send ever increasing lengths of A's. Very simple, easy to do. Uh, save a bit of time in the lecture, we're going to exploit the Trun um, command for this for our purposes. So just let me get to the right place. So this is a very simple Python program. We connect to our IP, a port. We take our input and convert it to the right format. We create a socket. We then receive the banner. We saw the help vulnerable server. We receive that banner, because if we don't do that, it won't programmatically talk to it. We then print something to the screen. We then send whatever we define in the length of our attack, the try and command plus the attack, send it and receive, and clear down. Fairly simple bit of Python. So let's give it a go. So if we give it, let's say, 500 A's. No, that's not trust my luck. Is my server running? So we sent 500 A's that time, and we can see our connection, and we can see our program is running. So 500 A's didn't really trigger anything. 
So let's send it a little bit more. Let's send it 2,000 this time. Now, whoops, we crashed it. Yay, so 2,000 A's crashes the program. Okay, so let's restart the program again. And we're going to try 3,000 as well. Now the reason for why 2,000 and 3,000 will become apparent later on, but we've crashed the program. So anything above 2,000 bytes triggers the buffer overflow. So we'll restart our program. And this time, what we'll do is we'll attach uh, a debugger to it. So this is Immunity. It's a freely available debugger which you can get um, from debugger.immunity.com. What we have to do is we have to, when it attaches, it pauses the execution of the flow. So we're directly attached to the VOM server process. So if we start it back up, and what you see here is you see the registers we mentioned. You see the actual assembly of the module that we're in. You see a dump and you see the stack. Okay? So the program is running. Now, if we send out 3,000 characters, it will record the crash. Which is what we'll do. And boom, we've crashed. So we can see that we've got an access violation. Um, what's happened is, oh look, ERPs are written over by 41. 41 is the hexadecimal version of A in computer language. So our A's have overwritten the IP. Other things to note, we can see in the EAX register our actual command here. But more importantly, we can see this register, ESP, stack pointer, it has some of our data in it. Okay, this is fundamental. If this is not here, then this doesn't work, and we get a denial of service. So if we actually also look at that memory address as well, and we'll do... We can also see that that area of memory is where our A's are. Okay? So we've got a whole load of A's in here, and they start at this address here, okay? And they go all the way down that bottom address there. So if we subtract the first address from that address, we've got the size of our buffer. It's 980 bytes. So you do subtract two decimals and turn them back. That's plenty enough space for our shellcode. Shellcode is anywhere between 350 to 500, depending on what functionality you're putting into it. So we've got a whole lot of space. So where do we go next with this? Right, so we just need to restart. The next thing we need to actually do is to work out. So we had our buffer of 3,000 A's. Somewhere in there, EIP gets overwritten. Somewhere in, in this whole buffer. We need to work out where in that buffer. Okay? So one way we could do it is we could split the buffer into A's and B's. Okay? This is called the half split or binary tree analysis method. If it's in the B's, fine, and you make that uh, last 750. So you split it up and you keep splitting it down basically. So you keep splitting it. And eventually, seven times after, you'll find the exact four bytes that overwrite EIP. It's a painful way of doing it, there's a better way. The better way is to create a cyclic pattern. So a cyclic pattern is 3,000 characters that are not repeating. And that's a bit painful, but guess what, Metasploit helps us. So I'm just going to start the process off because it does take a little bit of time for Metasploit to do it. So there is a, um, a command called pattern create. And if I copy this and put it into this other window here, eventually, Great, I say. So we'll leave that to do that and we'll look at the next piece of code. So 
So this is the next piece of code. It's pretty much the same as the last time, except instead of our attack, we're just sending out cyclical pattern that we're creating with Metasploit. Okay, so we're just sending this whole load of junk, and then we see what happens. So we go back to our program. This time, we attach our debugger again. Make sure our program is running. And we just run out. So it's sent our buffer. And lo and behold, we have a crash. Again, important things to note. We've got our command in here. We've got our cyclical pattern appearing in here, in memory. And we've got this, this set of numbers, overwriting EIP. Now we have to do a little bit of work to these to work out where they are in the pattern, but we'll show you that in a second. But more importantly, again, is that if we follow this in the dump, we can see our cyclic pattern in memory down here, and now 980 bytes. Okay, so we need now need to work out where in our string of 3,000 we get the overwrites. So the way we do this is let's go back to our pattern create. Hopefully, it's created. So there's our pattern create. So it's created the same pattern as you saw in the exploit. If I show you this little bit of there are different ways to do this, but what we have to do is, no, it's not in here. Okay, we'll do it on. We have to convert those numbers you saw into the ASCII. So when Metasploit creates a pattern in ASCII, the debugger shows everything in hex. This little bit of code here does that, it just literally puts these into an array, uses the truncate command to get rid of them, and then uses that command to turn them out. So the trick here though is to remember the endianness of our processor. So processors are either a big engine or little engine, um, x86 is little engine, so every time you write an address it's backwards. So you read it that way, you have to write it in your code that way. If you get it wrong, things stop working. So if we take our, if we take our <coughs> code here and run it now, we get this. So that can, so basically the numbers that we saw here in these numbers <coughs> here, three nine six F, are converted into ASCII as. 8C09. So somewhere in this pattern is 8C09. Anybody want to try and find it? It's a long way to find it, right? Guess what? Metasploit helps us again. So there is a script. It's right in now called pattern offset. And we need to give it what we're looking for, which in this case is 8C09. And we wait. And if this is correct, we should see it's at, at offset 2006. So what that means is that the four bytes of the IP are written over after the 2006 character. So 2007, 8, 9, and 10. Okay? So if so we now know where we can overwrite EIP. So what we need to now do is confirm that that's correctly the case. Okay? So next bit of code. So this is our next bit of code. What we're doing is the same thing, connecting to our server. Here we've set 2006 characters. We've set Bs as the variable EIP. And the padding we have set as 3000 minus our 2006 minus our 4 for our. And then we build it up as a buffer. So it now looks like as 2000 and 0. So it looks like this. Let's just draw it. So we've got 0 to 
2006. A's, F's, E. Okay? So what we're going to do is we're going to run this code and we should see in the debugger that EIP equals 424242, which is B. So let's make sure our program is running. Let's close it down. Restart. sent our buffer and this time we've crashed. So we've got A's, this time we've got our F's in our data and we've got our four twos. So we've now successfully known we can overwrite EIP and we can put data in and after. So if you look in the dump, we follow and obviously ESP now points directly into our shell cap or well, area of the S. Okay? So this, I said earlier that this was significant, we need this. So if in our buffer ESP points, if we do the assembly language equivalent of jump ESP, which means jump to the location in memory where ESP is pointing to, okay? so if we can find a jump ESP instruction, we can control execution flow. So what we do is the buffer goes to the 2006, when it hits the address in memory we want to, or address in memory we want, it will jump to that address. In that memory address we'll have a jump ESP which will make it jump into here. Because ESP is pointing to there. Okay? I might show you the slide. <coughs> Let's see if I can show you the slide. So that's probably where is it? So So this will be later on, but effectively the EIP overwrite happens and then we can do various other things. But that's how we control the execution flow. So let's see if we can find somewhere in memory where we might find a jump PSP instruction. Now this is where, it, where in exploit development it gets a little bit, it can always get a little bit tricky. So, this screen here in Immunity shows us the DLLs or library <coughs> files in Windows, the same as Linux.so files, that are loaded. This also shows our application and the DLL file I mentioned earlier. Okay, so we can search in these places in, in memory for our John PSP instruction. So, if we use a system DLL, then the exploit will be tied to the version of the operating system and the service pack because the code in these things changes. So if we're on XP Service Pack 2, it'll only work on XP Service Pack 2. What we want to do is try and keep it within the program we're trying to exploit. So what you could do is you could go through and search, you can do this manually, go through and search all of these for jump ESP instructions, but we'll start here, because it's the most logical place to start. So there's the jump, no, this is a bug in immunity where it, go, it doesn't go into the right module. So, let's get into the right module. No, come on. Right, so the way we do that is we right click and we search for the command, we find jump ESP. So, there is a jump ESP command located at this memory address, 6250118F. Okay? So, what we can do is we can hard code that in our code and then we can test that when the code executes, the jump happens, the execution happens. So we can set a breakpoint on this memory location. So we'll do that, that should be the breakpoint set. So let's go back to our code and have a look at the next example. So, it's the same again, we connect to our memory on our port, we do our buffer, this time we've got our memory address written backwards, so if you look in 
here, there's our memory address, 62, and it's written that way. So in our code it's written like this. What we've got afterwards is this slash x90. So slash x90 in assembly on x86 means no operation. Sit there and do nothing processor. Okay? And then we've got these other ones, slash xcc. That means breakpoint. And then we've got our padding. So our structure we've made here now looks something like this. We've got 2006 A's. We've got whatever it is, uh, 625011AF in that memory. Then we've got So we've got four whites there, 16 there, 2006 in there, and then we've got the rest. So we've got our A's, our jump, our knobs, and our axes. What we should do is we should see the buffer execution go like this, and then at this point it should go to our memory address here, the 62. So we'll look at that in the debugger and see that that's the case. Let's just make sure our debugger is sorted, breakpoint is sorted. Right, so run this. So it sends it, and as you can see, we've stopped our debugger here. We've stopped. So our execution flow has been overridden by EP and we've executed our memory. And then if we do single step, let me do single step for me now. Yeah, it jumps to our knob sled. And then if we carry on, it will continue operating our knobs till we get to our four sixes, which is F. So as you can see, for Neumann machine, sequencing execute instructions. So now what we can do is replace these Fs with some shellcode. So shellcode is the assembly language instructions to make something happen. That can be to like pop a message box. Um, but in this case, what we're going to do is we're going to spawn a command shell and send it to the attacking box in memory. So we're going to corrupt the memory, and then we're going to run our code in memory, and it's going to send us a command shell. So first off, we have to create our shell code, and that is another job for Metasploit. It has lots of shell code encoders. So let me just show you the uh, where's our shell code. So this will take some time, and it will moan that I'm using something that's deprecated. But let's just leave that run. So what we're doing is this is wrong because our host is well in this case so what we're doing is we're asking for this payload which is our command shell we're telling it which IP address to send it to we're sending it on port 443 this bit exit function means we're going to come out of a thread you know, when we exploit it rather than the process if you do it as a process you can crash it we're again going to encode it. Oh, we've, we've missed something out actually. We need to go back one stage. We're going to encode it, and so let's leave that running. We'll do the bad characters. So there's one thing we've missed. He says. So problems we can encounter. Uh, the bad character problem. Certain characters um, in hexadecimal have meaning. So 0x00, zero, 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 um, in C means terminate the string. So if you, that will just stop us, our code executing. So you don't want any of those in there. For example, 0x0a zero, zero, is a line feed, 0x0d zero, zero, is a carriage return, and 0x20 is 13 Tilidatsky, which is space. So if we have those characters as part of our shell code, it stops working. So all we have to do is make sure we don't have any bad characters. How do we do that? We do that like this. 
you can see Metasploit has actually generated me my shell code. But let's do the bad characters. So. So this is our bad character check. So again, we've got our IP address. Our um, we just got the IP as being just B's and an offset. This is all the hexadecimal characters minus zero x zero zero. We don't want that one. So what we'll do is we'll do that, see it in the buffer, and look at it in the debugger, and see if any of these characters get corrupted. If any of those characters get corrupted, they become bad characters and have to come out of our shell code. So let's, let's run it, let's make sure we're, we've still got to there, yeah, pause, uh, let's, let's just the previous one, let's restart it, attach our debugger, make sure it's started, Go to our run it, and we can see our crash. If we look at our memory, we can see here we can see our not sled 0x90. We can then see 01, all our characters going down. And if we look, we'll just scroll down, and if we keep going, there is the end of our buffer with our if padding and LCC. So we can see that all our shellcode characters are good. We have, apart from 0x00, we don't have any bad characters. So back to when I was encoding before, this line here, this part means I don't want any zeros. And this is the encoder to use x86. So this produces this rather strange looking stuff, and this is going to be inserted in our buffer and will run a command.exe and send it to us. So let's just have a look at the actual exploit. So, X exploit gets a little bit simpler. We have our 2000 A's, our address, our slash X90's. Our shell code, and then our padding, our Fs, and I'll generally send it to the target code. So if all is good and all works, this is what should happen, he says. So we should have. Our shellcode starting, we should overwrite EIP, transfer it into our memory, which holds the jump PSB command, which then forwards us back to our not sleds of the slash x90s, into our shellcode we've made, and into our breakpoints. And if that happens, we're all good, we'll have a command shell. So, the last part to do is to test. So, what we do is we clear here. And we set a netcat listener ready to receive our command shell. And over here, we have our program. So we don't need our debugger now, so let's clear out our debugger. We could do a further stage where we run it in the de debugger. See it hit the execution EIP breakpoint, watch it go into the shell code, but we won't we don't need to do it at that stage. So here's our program running. So let's set our listener up. the IP address of that one, and just so we're, we're clear, 
there's the IP address of that one. So if I put them side by side, I think you'd agree that equals that. So we have remote command execution on the so we can do we can do any Windows commands we like anything built into your operating system. We can now download key loggers, we can download further exploit tools onto it. Um, typical uses of this would be if you're doing a network penetration test and you want to laterally move through a network and you find a vulnerable host, this could um, give you a shell on that host and then exploit your privileges further. So there's some other things I want to point out to you guys as well. This is running in memory, okay, on the Windows target. If we close the program, Okay. That, that did clearly. That's what it should do, yeah. So it, it closes the connection. So what you tend to have to do is to migrate. Um, I need another desktop. There's one last thing I want to show you. So it's repeatable, okay? It works um, because we're using that DLL. It works even if you reboot the operating system. The reason for that is if I show you the actual Unknown Process Explorer, which is So process explorers from the system internals web site, uh, part of Microsoft. Here is our program. Notice that it has data execution prevention, one of the protections in Windows, but it doesn't have an ASLR. So ASLR is addressed by layout randomization, and what that means is when a program is loaded each time, all the DLLs are loaded at different, very, different locations. So it makes exploitation very, very much harder. So if you use old programs that don't have that protection built in when they're compiled, this is the kind of thing that can happen to you. So using old FTP servers and modern, modern um, Windows operating systems, old software, no ASLR, no protection. Microsoft even shipped a version, I think of Office 2010, with a DLL compiled like that. So, um, where are we now? So, oh, and one last thing. I want to debug one more myth. Antivirus does not protect you against memory corruption bugs. Despite what anybody will tell you, you've just seen it. That's a fully patched Microsoft Security Essentials and it didn't stop me exploiting the vulnerable program one little bit. If you want to protect against things like this inside a network, in a company, then you need to use other tools, either um, IDS, IPS or CM, um, which is security information and event monitoring. So, Excuse me, you said, you said the shell was running in memory, yeah. and that if the, if the whole process was shut down on the machine, then, then, then the shell, shell dies. Did you say you were going to do something else to make a new shell? Um, what you can do is... A persistent shell. The, what you can do is, depending, this is a very easy code. So in Meterpreter, if you have a Meterpreter shell, you can actually migrate your processes. So you can actually migrate from the process you're in, which you've exploited, to a safer process. And commonly, this is done in flash exploits. So, you know, if you get exploited on flash, the first thing it does is migrate out the process so that when you click the cross on your browser, they've still got access to your machine because it's now running in IE. I haven't demonstrated it with an interpreter shell, but you can do. But yeah, you, this is a very simple um, command shell um, exploit just to show you how it works. So I think we're almost done, apart from. So this is CVE 2012 5959-5959. This is an example in the libupmp library and the intel upmp libraries. There are basically tons of these buffer overflows in them. Um, HD Moore found a load of them and there is lots of um, things in Metasploit to exploit these. 
So this is just an example. There are other ones, but that's less than two years ago because because you start with the year and the numbers go up each month. So that's towards the end of 2012, basically. So lost. This is something that we have around here in Jersey. I'm not telling you where it is, but it has a vulnerable UPnP stack, exactly the same as the code you saw. It is vulnerable. Exploiting it is not too difficult. It might happen, it might not. There was, at one stage, only 20,000 of these devices. Between there is now about 9,000. Um, there is 700 in Jersey, or there's some in Bahrain. Um, you know, if you knew what you were doing, you could do kind of bad stuff. So, that's it, guys. Questions? You were know, talking about how it's mostly affecting sort of older or poorly programmed software. Would you say this is sort of a legacy attack type now, or will you say it's still very much alive and well? It's still very much alive and well. Yeah, um, you know, it shouldn't be. It should be dead a very long time ago. You know, you should be using safe C type functions in your programming. You should be adopting a secure uh, development lifecycle, and you should be doing code reviews in your code. But they're still here. There's code hanging around from written a long time ago. That libupnp library was written a very, very long time ago. You know, recent attacks, slightly different, but again, old code not looked at, heart bleed, um, an absolute classic, an information disclosure bug. Um, you know, so, yeah, I still think we'll see them for a little while yet. Would you say they have any sort of successor attack style, or...? Have, do you mean, do they elevate into a new form? Yeah. Um, well, I suppose I, I tend to put these in the class of memory corruption because we are corrupting the memory. That's my own personal view. So then, modern versions of memory corruption that carry on further are things like heap sprays, um, things like GOTR, oh, GOTR also so really. Um, use after freeze are another common one with the same sort of memory corruption bugs, and they're still definitely well alive out there. Um, if you look last week. There was a bug in Flash that caused Adobe to uh, send out three um, updates in less than two days, and that was actively exploited by the Angry Cat Exploit Kit, and they have got the ability now to run the exploits in memory. And they did 110,000 Facebook users with it. That's nothing in terms of Facebook's user, but it's still 110,000 machines compromised. But, um, so generally speaking, though, this is a Windows specific flaw. No, it's, it's completely related to the memory. It's completely re it's it's across any computer system. If you code the C like that example that I had, if you have or use a vulnerable function and don't put the protection in, then you have a buffer overflow. The trick is just writing the shell code for the architecture. The shell code is independent of the architecture. So x86, which is what you saw here, then x64 is different, ARM is different, MITS, you know, it's just depending on the object. But if I'm running on a Mac OS, I can still write for it. For you, can, you, you, can, you, you, can, you can write that um, original example in C and do the same buffer overflow on a Mac. It will work. It's just harder to, maybe the memory structures are different, but buffer, uh, it's, right. it's a universal. If you know that, you can still use it and, and exploit it. In theory, yes. Right. Thank you, gentlemen, ladies. Thank you.